Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's uh, Crunch Seminar. Uh, today, uh, we have two presentations. Uh, the first presentation will be given by uh, Bijay Gag and Venkatesh Gopinath. Uh, Bijay Gag is a researcher at Boss Research in India. Uh, he holds an integrated master's in physics from the Indian Institute of Technology in Taranpur. Uh, presently, he is working on an application of hybrid and physics-based modeling at Bosch, and his research interests are computational physics, applied mathematics, and scientific machine learning. Uh, Benkatesh Gopinath is a senior researcher at Bosch Research in India. He has a PhD a, in computational physics from the IPGP University of Paris and a master's in computational mechanics from Simne Barcelona Tech and CN King's Institute, uh, Swansea University. Presently, he's working on simulation techniques for topics within vibration, fluid mechanics, and thermal systems for automotive applications at Bosch. Yeah, his areas of interest are computational physics, fluid dynamics, and scientific uh, machine learning. PJ and Venkatesh, uh, thank you so much for your time today. And with this short introduction, uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, John, for, for the introduction. Thank you. So shall I start now? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So uh, first, uh, I, I would like to uh, thank you, Professor Kanedakis uh, and the organizers uh, to give us the opportunity to, to present our work here at this Crunch Seminar uh, Brown. And uh, today uh, I'll be presenting on uh, on this physics informed neural networks for modeling dynamic linear elasticity. So, so here uh, uh, we have this uh, motivations. Uh, so uh, given uh, vibration information at a very limited location, uh, can we simulate the complete vibration behavior? It, uh, for example, uh, if we have some uh, vibration um, data at some very few sensor locations, so using that uh, data, can we simulate the whole system? And uh, given the, this vibration information, can we identify the material properties using some AI and physics? And uh, the next is like uh, uh, fast surrogate models. So let's say uh, we have given a few uh, set of parameters where we know the solution and uh, we want to identify uh, the solution at unseen parameters. Uh, in, uh, in this, let's say uh, these blue ones uh, could be uh, the unseen parameters in this space and this green one, the green one can be uh, uh, the parameters where uh, we know this uh, simulations or, uh, or the measurement. Um, so uh, to answer all this, uh, uh, we are uh, we are going to use uh, uh, physics informed neural networks, and uh, we we're going to explore how the spin can handle such problems in vibrations. Uh, so uh, in order to for forward uh, uh, forward uh, uh, move forward, uh, we we first try to solve. Uh, a plane instant problem. So here uh, is, is our problem statement. Uh, we have this uh, cantilever beam, uh, which is uh, fixed on this left uh, left hand side, and uh, the right hand side is being sub subjected to some harmonic uh, function. And uh, to simulate this, uh, we have to solve uh, these governing equations. And uh, as we can see, this first two equations coming from the momentum, Newton's laws, and uh, and then uh, we have additional three equations uh, coming from the stress and stress relations. So, and where uh, this lambda and mu are these uh, material properties, uh, which is coming from the material stiffness. So uh, here we explore uh, uh, the pins for the forward problem. So first we see how uh, we, we generate the data. So for the training and the testing, uh, we generate the data from NSYS simulations. Uh, so here we generate for this set of uh, parameters. So basically this is a soft material um, and uh, we compute the solution at uh, 1001 cross 51 grid points. And uh, 
and simulate it for approximately three seconds. And uh, we collect this data at 100 time instant. And uh, here is our solving methodology with uh, pins. So first of all, we do this non-dimensionalization of the quantities. So to do that, uh, we scale all the uh, real values by their absolute maximum uh, in, this, in, the range, in the domain. And uh, also, uh, as we can see these parameters, lambda and mu, we also scale it to this uh, same scaling factor to make it simpler. And uh, once uh, the model is trained, uh, we rescale back to its original dimensions. So uh, for the for the pins, uh, what we do is that uh, we take uh, the spatial, uh, this non-dimensional coordinate and the time, non-dimensional time as an input, and the output are the non-dimensional displacement and stresses. And uh, as we know already that for the pins, uh, we have to consider uh, uh, the data loss and the equation loss. Uh, and we know that the data loss can come from the initial or the boundary condition and also the measurement data. And the loss equations can coming from the governing governing equations. So for, for the loss data, uh, we have some reference data at some discrete locations. So we compute the data loss for 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 uh, for the displacement in x and y, and also for the the normal in the shear stress uh, with the with this reference data. And uh, we calculate this uh, loss equation in this non-dimensional form. So it looks a bit complex, but when we do this non-dimensional, we uh, get these equations. And uh, we for uh, and for for the momentum, we get these two equations, and for the stress and stress relations, we get these three equations. And uh, next, we add all these equations to get a fire to get a total, let's say, equation loss. And uh, and finally, we compute the net loss by computing uh, by doing the sum of the data and the equations. And for this, we use a mean square error. Uh, in the loss function, and uh, and here uh, we see uh, this uh, training data. So uh, for training, uh, we consider one point five, five point nine, and uh, eleven point six percent boundary knot data at different time at all the time instants. So here uh, we can see in the picture. Uh, 1.5 and uh, five in this uh, different percentage of data. So with 1.5, we have uh, we select very sparse points in the in the boundary, and also we don't consider any training data at the interior nodes. So uh, yeah, and uh, also we consider uh, this neural network architecture with these layers and uh, this number of layer uh, layers and neurons, and uh, we use. Uh, thousand collocation data as uh, each uh, gradient uh, descent. And this collocation data is uh, generated using uh, latent hypercube sampling. And uh, we, we train all the model with uh, this, uh, this many epochs and uh, with the uh, atom optimizer with this learning rate. And uh, once this model is trained, we can see. Uh, so here uh, in, in this slide, we can see there's results for different uh, training percentage. So as we can see in this loss over the epochs, uh, the uh, the loss converts faster as we increase the training data. And uh, to measure the deviation of true solution, uh, from the true solution, we uh, we use this error matrix so-called uh, normalized root mean square error, which is given by this formula. So it's a kind of a relative way of calculating the error, uh, which is, um, uh, with respect to the minimum and the maximum values of the quantity. And uh, and here we see uh, the error in uh, in x displacement in x direction ux with different at different time. And uh, here we can see this error uh, in uh, y displacement and in, in y direction uh, with a different time. And as we can see as we are increasing the data, the uh, the error is decreasing. And also the error is uh, consistent. So all, all the time the error is fluctuating to some mean, some mean value. And uh, here also for the stress, we can observe the same thing. And here is a table showing uh, the error uh, 
in displacement and stress with respect to different uh, training percentage on the on the boundary so as we can see that uh, with just uh, uh, 1.5 percent data which is very sparse we, we can uh, we are able to accurately capture the displacement but uh, here we can see the stress are not uh, being captured well um, <clears throat> And uh, as we increase the data slightly, the stress are also getting better. And uh, we can see in this movie, uh, the displacement in X uh, with the uh, different uh, percentage of data uh, with, uh, with uh, 1.5, which is very small. And it's, uh, and it's, it's matching with those uh, actual uh, values. And uh, and the next we see uh, the stress prediction uh, with just 1.5% data and we observe that the stress are not uh, predicted well uh, as we have seen earlier. But uh, when we increase the data slightly, uh, as you can see here, 11.6% uh, the stress predictions are uh, getting better. So, uh, so the conclusion here is that uh, by increasing the data, we can uh, imp uh, improve the quality of stress predictions. And uh, the, the motivation is why pin, not other regression models. So here is the sort uh, 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 kind of a summary, like uh, if you use other uh, regression model like NN uh, for the forward problem, um, uh, we can see the, uh, the behavior. So here uh, we train the the model with uh, uh, with 11.6 percent boundary data. We don't use any interior data, and uh, we train it. So and the basic uh, difference we can see in the ANN is that uh, ANN does not account for any equation. So but the pin um, take account of the equations, uh, and we can see the error, the error uh, the the loss over the iterations for this uh, uh, ANN and the pin. Uh, and uh, the right hand side we can see uh, once the model is trained we can see the error in x and y direct and in the y displacement um, uh, that uh, the pin is performing better as we can see it's uh, it's way better like uh, it's two order is small uh, in terms of error and uh, here uh, in this movie uh, we can see the the prediction quality of ann and the pin uh, uh, we can see here uh, with just using boundary data, the pin is uh, able to uh, predict the solution, but ANN uh, is kind of overfitting. So we can uh, uh, so we can conclude that uh, that ANN won't be able to predict uh, without giving any interior data, but uh, but yeah, pin still works. Uh, so uh, so that's the uh, that's the the motivation of uh, our our. Our first thing that uh, you know, if we have some data at some uh, at some uh, at sparse locations, uh, maybe at the boundary of of your component, then maybe using that data and some physics, we can imp we can um, we can predict this uh, uh, the the uh, the the vibration behavior at uh, at all at, at all the points. And uh, and here uh, we see uh, the. We explore the pins for the inverse modeling. So basically, uh, like uh, the motivation for inverse modeling is that uh, in uh, in industry, um, like uh, uh, to uh, uh, to to model a device or uh, to model a component uh, or anything, uh, we have to exactly know the material material properties of that material. And uh, in order to uh, find the accurate uh, material properties, we have to do a lot of uh, forward simulations and, uh, and, uh, and, and compare with the experiment. And then we find the best parameters which, which fit uh, uh, with, uh, with the experiment. And, uh, that, uh, uh, and that lead to a lot of computations and uh, time cost. And uh, so the idea here is that uh, can, can PIN uh, work, uh, can be used as a solution for such kind of problems. So here uh, we have um, we have shown for uh, for for this uh, real material uh, still, and for this uh, we uh, we generate this data from NCS FEM simulations with this uh, parameters as you can see this parameter ranges uh, for this still, and uh, uh, also uh, 
uh, we solve for uh, like around 3 seconds or something and uh, here is our uh, solving methodology so what we do is that for inverse modeling we already know that uh, for for the uh, for the pins we have to pass them as additional parameters along with the weights and biases so here uh, we represent uh, the lambda and mu uh, the, the parameters the uh, as a weights are given by this theta of lambda and theta of mu and uh, and then uh, the lambda lambda prime which is uh, which is our prediction is given by uh, like some function of this these parameters so basically this f is a is a constraint function we can say for this parameters and uh, that uh, highly affect the uh, the prediction quality and uh, once the uh, model is trained we can uh, rescale these parameters using some scaling uh, using some scaling parameters so this scaling parameters priori we don't know so we can um, we can have some expert guess or something if it is a, if it is a non material or something closer to non material but let's say for still uh, we assume that uh, the 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 stiffness can be in order of let's say 150000 uh, mpa so we can assign this as an uh, as an scaling uh, uh, quantity and uh, and additionally uh, we use this uh, 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 concept called uh, modified neural network architecture uh, in our model so we have seen that uh, uh, using that uh, is enhance our results uh, and uh, uh, we can find this in more details in this paper and additionally uh, we also uh, use uh, this hard boundary con con constraints uh, because uh, we know that our beam is fixed on the left left hand side so that uh, the displacement is going to be zero there so uh, which is given by this at uh, at any location y and any time t and uh, <clears throat> here uh, we we consider that our uh, uh, this uh, these two things are our uh, n u x prime and n u y prime are this non dimensional displacement uh, outputs coming from neural network and then uh, the final output is given by this using some distance functions so whenever uh, whenever we are at the at the left boundary when x is zero then automatically the 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 prediction for displacement gets to zero so this is a, a simple way of uh, uh, constraining the boundary conditions and uh, next we uh, train our model uh, with this set of uh, architecture and uh, we also use uh, uh, different constraint functions so from linear sigmoid and then hyperbolic and uh, we see next uh, how this uh, uh, the constraint function affect the accuracy and for the training here we we do some more assumptions that uh, we not only take the data at the boundary like we previously saw we also take uh, data close to here on the left side where the gradient is high uh, for the stresses and also some of the very sparse interior data and uh, here uh, we can see the results for different uh, combination of uh, uh, this auxiliary this functions and uh, different boundary conditions Uh, uh treatment so first here if we see uh, for a hard boundary constraint uh, constraint if we use a linear uh, constraint function uh, sigmoid uh, or the ten hyperbolic so out of this only uh, we have observed that the sig by using sigmoid works because it uh, it maps to the positive values always so um, but the other linear and ten hyperbolic can go to a uh, uh, positive and a negative which can uh, lead to um, kind of a bad local minima and also if if we don't use any hard boundary con uh, constraint in the model uh, we are not able to predict accurately and uh, here for the uh, for this uh, for, for this for the part for this setting uh, we can see uh, the prediction of uh, parameters um, uh, mu over the epochs so it's it's converging to the to the ground uh, to the actual value and uh, also we can see for the other parameters uh, it is also converging and the error is uh, like uh, for both less less than like 3% or something uh, 
and uh, next uh, uh, our motivation uh, is to uh, have a pin as a surrogate model so uh, so what we have is that uh, uh, we have some uh, simulations for some uh, some discrete uh, set of at some discrete set of parameters so um, for example here uh, we, uh, we we get uh, the data for we get the data for different parameters ranging from 0.5 mpa to 0.3 mpa and uh, we keep the lambda fix for the all the simulations and uh, <clears throat> and out of this uh, we take some uh, parameters in this training and the some in the testing and also we consider uh, 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 this much percentage of data uh, on the boundaries we don't take any interior uh, data for the training so as you can see uh, this uh, left hand side these are the training uh, set of parameters and uh, in between this range uh, we have this testing set of parameters and this is the error in the displacement x and in x and y direction um, we can uh, we can see uh, it's we can see here it's uh, uh, it's one order low, uh, it's one order higher in in case of test uh, testing parameters but for displacement it's uh, acceptable uh, and uh, next uh, we uh, we solve this uh, surrogate uh, surrogate base modeling uh, in 3d so here uh, we have this uh, the same beam problem uh, with the excitation in this two direction is given by these functions you can see and uh, here we generate this data at this many grids and for this much time and also these parameters are going to the same range as previous and here uh, we consider the uh, the data at this uh, surface nodes so and here uh, we have to solve uh, like uh, three momentum equations coming in, in xyz and uh, six uh, stress and stress relations so here uh, we can see like um, here uh, in, in inputs we can see we have this uh, spatial and the temporal coordinates and also uh, these parameters as an additional input and the output will be uh, three uh, displacement uh, in xyz direction and the three normal and three shear stresses and uh, once we train the model on the 3d uh, we can uh, do the prediction on this training and the testing and here we also uh, observe the similar thing uh, that uh, it's 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 working but uh, uh, with uh, one order higher error but then uh, from uh, from our uh, understanding uh, we um, we uh, is it still acceptable and uh, next uh, we um, we solve uh, we, we see uh, for the unseen parameter one of the unseen parameters uh, the solution at uh, different uh, uh, at different surface so here uh, for xy plane uh, and uh, at this z equals to five we can see uh, the solution uh, changing over the time so uh, here we can see it's 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 pretty well matching with this uh, ground truth and here is the solution at different plane uh, as we can see and uh, here uh, it's also matching with the uh, with the ground truth and uh, this is again this uh, solution at uh, at some different plane and we can see it's also getting close but in in some of the field uh, it is not matching because, because the um, uh, in in scale almost it's same so there will be like um, uh, th there will be more gradient in 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 that way, but uh, order wise it's it's matching. And uh, here uh, we uh, we see uh, the line plots or uh, the of the error at a different time. So this is uh, at the left end uh, of the beam. Uh, this one uh, this represent for the middle. Uh, end of the beam and this one at the right end of the beam and at this different location we can see the error in the displacement over different time so it's it's pretty well matched with the ground truth as we can see and uh, and the next uh, uh, we see uh, for this normal stress sigma xx sigma yy and sigma zz 
uh, we can see it's also uh, it's also matching well but there are some cases where we can see uh, the, where the stress is almost zero the prediction is fluctuating to that mean value so this we can observe in uh, in in some cases Vijay, it, how how you implement? Is this in uh, PyTorch or is it? Uh, uh, Professor, we have implemented this in TensorFlow. Because uh, Jax may give a bit uh, more accurate results for the stresses. Oh, oh, is it? It does a better job with a high order derivatives. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, next uh, we also see for the uh, CRE stresses. So for series stress, we also see that it's uh, it's pretty, it's it's matching with this order uh, at least. Uh, and we can see at some points when it's almost zero, it's fluctuating to that um, uh, to the zero, and where it's uh, uh, yeah uh, at some decent order, it's kind of matching. And uh, and uh, here uh, I, I would like to conclude uh, that uh, the spin can be successfully used uh, as a as a as a f approach for the forward modeling uh, and uh, with uh, even with provided very uh, little data uh, so from from our uh, uh, experiment uh, uh, we have seen that uh, with just using 1.5 bounding uh, percent bounding node data we are still able to predict the displacement accurately and also for the inverse modeling to find the material properties uh, we uh, we have seen that we have identified the parameters which is almost 90 percent uh, accurate and uh, also uh, for the surrogate modeling we have seen for the 2d and the 3d case uh, uh, the model is able to predict the solution for uh, for unseen parameters so which is within the range and uh, as uh, we as we know that inference is fast so which takes order of second and uh, if we go with normal uh, sol solver approach uh, then the simulation can take uh, uh, for example here uh, in our uh, experiment it takes like 20 minutes on the cpu so uh, we can uh, have a significant sp speed up uh, if we uh, do a kind of a surrogate mode based modeling using the pins um, and uh, for uh, more uh, details uh, you can uh, have a look on our paper uh, which is available on the archive currently and uh, we here for uh, more uh, yeah, if you are interested you can also go through the references um, and uh, i would like to thank you for uh, your attentions uh, if you have questions uh, please ask thank you so much for your presentation bj um... thank you Thank you. Do we do we have any other questions from the audience? Hi, uh, I see Uwe on the call, and I, I was wondering why didn't you use the uh, torch uh, physics code of Bosch that they developed? Why you you had to use your yeah, own? Yeah. So yeah, and the thing is we. Um, we started this work a long time ago, like around 2022, end of 2022, I guess. So yeah. that time only we were catching up with Torch Physics and we had already started to do intense flow. Uh, but now we are actually uh, planning to integrate with Torch Physics, the same thing what, what we have written. Yeah, we are currently trying to integrate it. Okay. Asuku, so, like you have a question, right? Yeah, I had a question Hi. on on the data, like on the model itself. Mm -hmm. For the question that uh, on the on the boundary, you entirely used uh, solution from ANSYS, or uh, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. We uh, for for our uh, training and testing purpose, we are using the data from simulations. So uh, yeah, uh, we don't, currently we haven't tried with any experimental data. But uh, right. this is our uh, kind of POC we tried. Because one thing I was wondering is, because you notice that in many cases where the stresses are zero, you were finding the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, how does it perform on traction-free boundaries, right? Where the stress uh, is. Because yeah, you're yeah, not yeah. explicitly, right? You're just yeah. using data. Right? Yeah. 
yeah yeah so yeah that's a good point uh, we are uh, we are looking forward to use uh, boundary losses or uh, this kind of uh, where we know uh, like traction boundary condition we have some surfaces where uh, we have these conditions so in future right. like uh, we, we we are uh, planning to it in the, in the model if it can yeah, if, if it can improve it yeah yeah because you yeah. you might have yeah. added explicitly right yeah, yeah. It, won't, it won't know that yeah there is yeah. everywhere yeah because True. you might have clear points it might be zero but it won't know what is in between right mm -hmm. if yes. you don't put the additional right so mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you thanks great do we have any other questions from the audience nickel do you have any questions <laughs> I I don't have any question. But I'm just wondering about one um, one point. Uh, if we do, you can go to the line plots. Um, uh, I was just wondering whether it's because we just discussed about like Professor Kardiraki suggested uh, if like you have an uh, issue with the higher data. You, I was wondering it's because of the frequency, like the neural network may have uh, trouble capturing the higher frequency in sigma y y. Can you go to the line plot? Uh, yeah, uh, and Professor, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, I was wondering if CAN would be a good uh, idea to use here if, because I see some um, higher frequency values in, at least in the, uh, some sigma y y values, and they had higher in forward problem. They yeah, could. It's very small value. That's why you see sigma y y into the minus six. Uh, okay. Or, I think or just do X pin, X pin in time, so you do the into, into, uh, into time intervals. So, so uh, sorry, Professor, can, can you repeat? Uh, I didn't catch. He, uh, Nikhil, um, is suggesting that you use uh, cans, this new Kolmogorov. Yeah. So we have the pi can, I, I just present in Portugal. And uh, so it, it seems to be a little better on the spectral bias. So Nikki okay. thinks the spectral bias, which is, could be true, but actually here, because this is in time, you, yeah. you simply split the domain from 0 to 1.5 and then from 1.5 to 3. Okay. Uh, then, okay. Because, uh, you know, imagine you have a, a time can go to infinity, right? You have bounded yes. domains in space, but time goes go to infinity, so you have to do it in segments. Okay, so x x pins kind of. Yeah, so x pin with x pin, it's relatively relatively simple implementation. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if uh, Uwe is here. Maybe Uwe already has a domain decomposition in the torch physics. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, Uwe is here actually. Um. Yeah. Also, regarding this point, have you tried? Uh, I saw that Suku had like a few months ago a paper that was called First Order Beans, and in which they, instead of getting the values from back propagation, they were like predicting them as outputs of the network. So that way, they were somehow obtaining better approximation of the higher order derivatives. Right, Suku? Are you there? I didn't catch you. What 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 did he say? He's uh, advertising the paper. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I so saw one of your recent studies. I think it's called first order pin or second order pin. Uh, I don't remember exactly. Then yeah, but that would more just... like... right. So but do you people think that would work here. I mean, people, uh, you know, because that, that the issue there was more on the boundary condition imposition. So when you split it up under two first order ODEs or PDEs, right, then you'd only deal with one derivative, right? So obviously things become faster, but then you do impose the constraint that they both, there's a connection between the two of them, right? It's like taking, you know, displacement and strains as, no, as the unknowns, then of course it reduces, but then the displacement must be equal to the strain, whatever you approximate, right? So there's a penalty on that, right? So, so I mean, there's no free lunch, right? You do, so. Yeah. Uh, I had a small question, one. 
Yes, please. Uh, yes, comments please. actually. So, uh, so this is Varun from Dama. I'm a PhD student here. Um, Hello. So I was wondering, like, uh, the first thing I was like curious about was, have you looked at like other sections for the beans, like I sections or T sections, just to see how the big beans like perform there? Uh, uh, we have uh for this one we we tried with the uh, 2D and 3D beam. Uh, but we have taken kind of a like a cuboid geometry as you can see in this picture yeah so this kind of geometry uh we have taken uh but it, yeah it would be nice to see for other geometry also because generally these beams are realistically mm -hmm. either mm -hmm. a t beam or i section huh. so mm -hmm. it would be yeah. nice to see how we yeah. can see how that yeah yeah um, uh, like we plan to use this on a like uh, step by step to a complicated geometry because ultimately we want to use it to reduce our um, simulation time in ANSYS, which runs into a lot of weeks. Uh, so yeah, we, sh we should try I section like you suggested, and then move on to like more and more complicated geometry. Then it directly applies to a use case. So we are working towards that. Uh, and, yeah, along with our other day-to-day, -day, you know, work. Okay, and uh, the other like comment I had was like about using pins as a surrogate for like your application. Um, so if you compare like pins with uh, like a traditional numerical solver, you also have the training time for pins. Yes. Right. Like, that yeah. you have to account for. Yeah. So, for instance, say like I have a case, uh, I have a numerical solver that solves within twenty minutes, but pins yeah. after training can give you a result in like one second. Mm -hmm. But if I change some parameter which you don't have in your input, uh, yeah. then you need to train, train pins again yes. uh, from scratch. So, yeah. how do you think like where does like your application fit uh, with respect to using pins as a surrogate model? Does it like have constant input uh, factors that don't change, or does it change, and you might have to retrain the pins again? Shall I answer that or you want uh, to... yeah, you can answer that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so the basically coming from the practical standpoint, we should know before that okay, these are my parameters which will change and these will change within this um limits. So we have to know priori that this is the limit so that we don't want to uh, have the testing space outside those limits. So that, and then uh, like uh, on the uh, training time front, um, it can be very useful if we have to do repeated simulations because the parameters can, can be sensitive. If the material changes and the parameter is not so sensitive, then we don't use pin, we use traditional FEM. So, that's something which before using pins, we have to see what is our parameter space, how much the parameters are sensitive, and we have to assess how it can be useful for us. So we saw that we are running into a lot of time, weeks of simulations, enhances repeated. So that's when we thought, okay, we should apply, try to use pin here, and then we had this pilot use case. But like you said, uh, we if the parameter range is outside the training, then um, for these constant parameters, uh, like we haven't tried outside the training space of the parameters, but I think in the initial paper itself, uh, or not not initial paper, I think one of the paper by uh, Professor IC, I think it, uh, for solid mechanics, uh, that was our motivation for this work. Uh, there, I think he had also shown that for unseen or un, uh, um, parameter range outside the trainable range, also it's predicting. But uh, for complicated geometry, 3D, I'm not sure. We have to test. The question, okay, I you. think, uh, Varun, I, uh, you, did, did you mean to say that they are better off using uh, uh, DeepoNet, for example, physics from DeepoNet? Yes, I mean, like, uh, to some extent, yes. Like, uh, I was basically, like, uh, trying to understand, like, 
I have a pens model. I trained it for like say like like ten hours or so. But then all of a sudden a parameter or something might change which will not be there in that uh, in your distribution. So now you have to retrain it. So like something like an operator network uh, as a surrogate in my view is probably more useful. But it again depends on the application. So uh, yeah, I don't so have an understanding it, of your application. Um, yeah, let's say uh, it'll be very useful. We are only testing it out. Like for example, if the excitation is uh, instead of uh, cos phi three cos phi t, it becomes uh, tan or something, or it's 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 uh, a random signal. Uh, then in those cases, we definitely we should move to operator learning and probably physics informed deep operator networks. Yeah, phys physics informed operator learning. Yeah, that, I think that's that's a good uh, compromise. Also. Uh, uh, Varun, for the problems that they are inverse problems, finite elements are very, very expensive. Yeah. Because they have to iterate many, many times. So definitely more yeah. expensive but, uh, than, than PIN. So uh, if, even with the training, if you, even if you account for the training course. So. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very, very nice talk. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Now, I have another question regarding the problems with the high order derivatives. Like, uh, did you try something like uh, residual connections? For example, there's this paper by by Paris, the Pirates, where they show that the problem with the high order derivatives is essentially the same problem that trains long neural networks with so vanishing gradients. So, did you try anything like like that, like adding residual connections to see if your if your high order derivatives improve? Uh, no, I think we should try it. Uh, if you can suggest that paper, we can take a look at it. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I'm um, so, yeah. Do we have any other questions from you? Ah, I'm looking for the early music. Yeah. Do we have any other questions in the meantime? Well, it's just one the comment uh, because we had a presentation of um, of Kant's for solid mechanics. It's a paper under review, and uh, one of the postdocs present here on Wednesday. And basically, in that paper, it's not our work; it's somebody else's work. Uh, basically, they show that uh, Kant's uh, beat MLB in most of the problems that they try and they they try they didn't try a 3d problem i think it was like a fracture problem and the uh, elham what elham what kind of problems are they I, for, I forgot the problem that you presented one was fracture was it the elasticity like this nonlinear elasticity or not uh yes it was uh one of them was fracture and uh like cracks singularity i can share in uh a chat is it on the archive? If it's on the archive, you cannot share it because it's under review. Uh, I think it's in archive. I can check that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the meantime, I, I put in the chat the link to the paper that I was presenting. Okay. Yeah, yes, please. Let me uh, check if it's in an archive. I can check that. I can share. So it's, it's 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 like physics in form, but instead of neurons, they use the Kolmogorov uh, representation. Okay. Okay. We we already published a paper like that, but we we see mixed results for dynamics in general, and okay. and the more expensive. Actually, they, these are also more expensive, but they don't talk about the cost. So. Yes, it is a uh, archive. I can share the link. Yeah, share the link of the archive. Yeah. Right. Oh. In the first page, yeah. uh, uh, there are some examples that they discuss in the paper. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Vijay. Thanks. Thanks for giving good talk. Thank you, Professor. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
just uh, one so any other uh, like suggestions you have professor for us to improve the work um, apart from the comments which we have no it's good it's good these are good tests No. Okay. If we don't have any other questions, thank you so much, BJ and Bingatesh, for your for your time. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we have a second speaker for today's uh, meeting. Uh, his name is Junyuan, but he prefers call, being called Jimmy. Uh, he's a senior application engineer at ANSYS. He obtained his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2023. His research focuses on computational methods in solar mechanics and accelerating simulations with scientific machine learning models. He actively collaborates with research scientists at ANSYS as well as the National Center for Supercomputer Applications at the University of Illinois on the confluence of machine learning and physics-based modeling. Uh, Jimmy, thank you so much for your time today. And with this short introduction, you can start whenever you're ready. All right, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much Ant, for, for, for your kind introduction. So yeah, then without without further delay, then now I'll go ahead and get started with my presentation. Um, should I should I keep my camera on all the time or uh I think that if if, if it will yes, be it's preferable. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll keep that on then. All right. Then hello everyone. Um. So today I'm gonna be talking about one of the uh, our, our recent work, which on um kind of geometric variation of the deep operator network. Um. That we specifically develop for some point based um some point cloud based um kind of application. So primarily, we wanted to do field prediction on 3D parameterized geometry. So let's go ahead and dive into um, this. So this is a, a collaboration with um, between ANSYS and University of Illinois, and specifically um, Mechanical Engineering Department, which is where I, where I was from, and also um, the NCSA, the Supercomputing Center, um, greatly provided um, their computing resource to us. So let's let's talk a little bit about why there's a need for um, rapid design evaluation and, and and there's a space for machine learning. So um, we, we all know that modern day digital engineering design involve repeated simulation on different design iterations. And a lot of these design that we typically encounter in, in engineering design, they're parametric models, meaning that these models are, are defined by a set of design parameters. Um, and then we, we know that when we run 3D finite element simulations, some of these simulations can be quite expensive. And therefore it, it makes us wonder that how we can ac accelerate our preliminary design evaluation process um, when we have to screen through a lot of designs to find out the high performing ones. So here um, it motivated us to create surrogate models um, via machine learning. But the, the, the definite challenge here is that um, for these three-dimensional engineering designs, we have to capture these variable 3D geometries that are described by different design parameters. And then also the difficulty is that we need to predict field variables, um, whether that be stress or displacement or, or plastic strain on geometry that's described by different meshes. So it typically comes with different number of nodes and elements um, because, because the different designs, they can differ drastically in terms of the local geometry feature as well as the size. So definitely when you, when you go ahead and discretize them, they'll most likely come with different numbers of nodes and elements. So we need to come up with some um, machine learning model that is able to capture that. So that's kind of the overarching goal of this research, which is to basically find a machine learning model um, for these parametric geometries um, to perform few prediction that is capable of handling these different numbers of nodes and elements. So an, a, a kind of quick outlook on what the high level workflow is gonna be like. So we first start with generating um, simulations on high performance, um, high performance computing clusters um, so in this case, we use Delta and NCSA to kind of cover the initial design space. 
once we have the initial um, kind of pool of training data, we then perform data extraction um, to get the mesh and all the solution field that we want to predict. And then we can do some data massaging, so normalization or some removing some of the outliers, um, some data preparation for machine learning. And then we send it over um, to the machine learning model to be trained on the cluster on a GPU. And then once the model is trained, we can then download the lightweight trained model in terms of the weight and biases, and then, then deploy the trained model on even low end platforms such as laptops, or we can even deploy them uh, on, on the web, like using Jupyter Notebook and stuff. And then, and then using the train model, we can feed in new geometries. And then um, the train model will be able to generate these new field, field predictions um, given new input geometry. So this is the kind of the, the overall workflow that we want to implement. And, and, and the key here is, is, is this machine learning model that we're going to be talking about today. So let, let's start by kind of looking into the literature and see what are available to us currently. Um, that that we can take for three D um, kind of geometry. So one of, one of the big ones definitely point at uh, which, as you can see from the title, it specifically mentioned deep learning on point sets for three D um, classification and segmentation. So initially, when when Poinet first came out, it's for a classification problem, but it has since been extended um, to regression models that we can generate um, these continuous prediction for different fields. Um, so, which, which is an example of that is shown in the right here. Um, those are um, taken from one of the previous work that uses um, point net for three-dimensional um, prediction on point clouds for CFD applications. So some of the, 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 the advantage of the point net architecture is that it's specifically designed to handle um, changing 3D geometry discrete, um, described by discrete points. But um, it's limited to input and output on a fixed number of points. So you you, you select a fixed number of points in, in the point cloud, and, in, and that's pretty much it. You, you use that in training, and you use that in prediction, and it generates that amount of, of, of data, and, um, no matter how you change the, 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 the point cloud. And then the second the second possible candidate here is um, Debo. Um, DeepoNet, which I think everyone should be familiar with and Brown, um, because it was, it was originally developed at Brown um, by Professor Karniadakis and um, Professor Lu Lu. Um, so here, the, the, the strength here is that it has great generalizability on unseen data, which is also one of the big thing that we want to capitalize on. Um, is on the generalizability. However, we do realize that it's not specifically designed for changing 3D geometries. It can be applied to um, 3D geometry, um, but it's typically used to just one geometry and it's not changing, especially not changing in the number of nodes. So um, that, that kind of also forms our basis for development of our new model here. Um, so let me let me let me kind of talk about our, our new model, which is um, what we call Geom Net, so specifically designed for changing geometries. So um, it follows the original DeepOnet architecture where it has a branch network and a trunk network. And then um, in the in, in, in the branch network, we're feeding in the different parameters that we talked about because um, in this work we're dealing with parametric models. So these geometry they are described by um, different geometry parameters, and we can also put in load parameter that kind of control the boundary conditions, um, how these geometry get loaded and different kind of scalar parameter. They all go into the branch network. And then um, in, in, in the trunk network, that's where typically where the geometry description goes. Um, so in this case, we have, because it's in 3D, we have the XYZ coordinate of those nodes. And then specifically, we're also adding um, one additional new feature, which is the sign distance function. So the sign distance function is it's it's one of the a very commonly used way um, to kind of describe parametric geometries um, and and that has also been used in, in a lot of implicit neural representation um, for shape representation and and three D rendering um, that are in, in the computer vision society and and a lot of that revolves around um, computing the sign distance function with respect to a reference surface which in this case is just an exterior surface. Um, of the geometry. So for each geometry, we can we can run a surface extraction that extracts the external surface, and we can compute the sign distance function of all the internal nodes with respect to the external surface. That basically tells you how far apart 
um, each node is to the closest exterior surface. So that kind of gives you some three-dimensional idea of um, location that uh, uh, about a current XYZ node compared to the exterior surface of the geometry that we're currently looking at. And then um, the other the other um, big change that we kind of add to um, this DeepNet architecture is basically the, the uh, intermediate data fusion that was um, studied a lot in the literature. Um, so here we, we also introduce some um, data fusion in terms of LMLI's um, multiplication um, by, by a tensor product that basically multiply the encoded information from the branch and the trunk network. And then, and then we kind of send them back their way to respectively for further decoding. Um, and then the last thing that we did here is um, here at this lower right here at the part of the, the, the trunk network after this data fusion, we, in, instead of using dense layer, we use Siren. Um, the sinusoidal activation, um, which is Siren was also um, used a lot in implicit neural representation um, because it is, it's very powerful spatial encoding capabilities, which we're also trying to leverage here to try to bring up the, the accuracy of the model as much as possible. And then, and, then, and then from there, it goes, goes as regular. We um, do a dot product between the encoding information from the branch and the trunk network to get to our prediction. In this case, the operator is both a function of the input point cloud X, as well as the sign distance function evaluated on those points. Um, and then we're predicting um, the vector solution at, at those discrete nodes. Um, any arbitrary component, the um, number of vector solution can be predicted. And those prediction can then be rendered on the um, volume mesh to show some field contour plot, which I'll show late, um, later in some examples. So specifically a big point that we wanna look at here is how do we handle meshes of different sizes? Uh, meshes of different geometries, they definitely have different number of nodes. So directly concatenating these areas of different shape together is not possible uh, because we just simply cannot concatenate areas of different shape together into one big area. Um, to, to accept meshes of different sizes during batch chaining. So the, the keyword here is during batch chaining. Um, so we're, we're talking about the training stage. There, there are two different things that we can do. Um, we either pad all the data array to a fixed size of zeros. Um, so so when, you, when you look at histogram, for, for a typical data set with changing geometry, you see a wide scatter of how many nodes in different meshes. So in this case, it goes way goes from 20,000 all the way to 60,000. So if you if you pet everything with zeros, you have to pet everything up to the highest number, which inherently increases um, your data set size with a lot of meaningful meaningless zeros, which is not very not not, not very good thing to do. Um, another thing is instead of going up, you can go down. So instead of padding everything to the largest size, let's say we subsample all the data. We don't use everything in that data set, but if we instead subsample everything to a fixed size, um, which is the, the approach that we take. And, and that's also coincident with a lot of the early um, deep operator network works that also use subsampling um, of, of, the out, of, of the input signal that sends that um, different input sensor, they subsample it so that they only get the, um, the input signal at some discrete points and then they, they kind of interpolate and extrapolate out to the different number of output sensor locations. And then now we, we move to the prediction stage um, because in, in the prediction stage, that's, that's where we want to kind of handle um, prediction on different number of uh, mesh nodes and elements. So to do that, we basically, when we build the model, we specifically make the data length dimension flexible. So that that that's that happens on on a coding level. We just declare them as as a flexible dimension, meaning that um, they can um, take in different number of um, number of points and then output those prediction on those points. We're also doing one geometry at a time um, instead of doing them in batches. Um, in, in training, we do them in batches because they're, they're a lot faster. Um, but for prediction, we, we kind of forego that and, and we do one prediction at a time. Um, so if we do one prediction at a time, there's no need for concatenating. So what we feed into the prediction can be different every time. So by using different approaches in model training and prediction, we benefit from efficient batch training um, so our training run very fast because um, they're batched, but we, we pay a higher cost 
by predicting one by one instead of in in batches. Um, that that's also a cost to pay, but we gain the but in 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 return we kind of gain the ability to run prediction on arbitrary number of match nodes so long as it fits into the memory, which we'll, which we'll co cover um, kind of in the results. So the, the natural question with with subsampling is is how much you can subsample and how does that affect your kind of the results. So so to look at that we we first take an example. Um, a data set that has changing geometry. And we kind of subsample just the input data set and we'll see how that kind of changes our, our distribution of the data. So, so we're not training anything at this point. Um, we're just looking at how that kind of changes our data distribution. So you see that uh, we, we, we have the same data set and we plot the histogram. We subsample all the nodes. So every mesh, we subsample it to 250 points, 1,000, 2,000, all the way to 25,000. And then we, we plot the histogram. And then we see that the distribution pretty much stabilized after you have about 2,000 nodes subsampled in, in each mesh. Well, well, all the mesh have way more than 2,000 nodes. So, so this kind of gives us some, some intuition that it might be possible for you to subsample down to just 5,000 nodes um, and, and still not lose a lot of information in your data set. So further, furthermore, we can actually run some training we train the model on different number of resample points. So you see here, uh, we have all the way from 200 all the way to 25,000. So of course, the more points you have, the larger the input data set is. Of course, the training time goes up. Um, but more interestingly is to look at the prediction accuracy. So when we look at the prediction accuracy, there's two different metrics that we can look at. So first of all, we can predict the outputs just at the subsample points. Picking 200 points in a mesh with 20,000 nodes is a highly oscillatory process. It's highly non-deterministic because you're only subsampling a very tiny portion of the, of the nodes. And, and to be representative, we want to also look at the result on the entire mesh. So that, that's the black line that you see here, which is prediction over the entire mesh, um, however many nodes that it has, and then, and, then, and, then, and then calculate the accuracy measure over the entire mesh. So, so of course, there's going to be some extrapolation when you when you when you predict on just the subsample point versus predicting over the entire mesh. So, of course, you you expect your 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 accuracy to 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 go down a little bit when you try to extrapolate to all the nodes um, within the geometry, which which you do see here at um, all the black lines situated above the the, the the yellow line here. So, showing that there's some extrapolation happening. But it's very interesting to see that there's not much difference. Uh, so when you when you look at the scale, it's not much different between the just on the subsample point or on the entire mesh. When you when you also compare the um, the variation across um, five different, so yeah, I think we repeated the training for five times. Um, each time we randomly sample the the the, the subsample points again, so fully random, and then we kind of look at the spread. We can see that there exists an optimal point where it kind of balanced the prediction accuracy as well as the scattering of the data. So 5,000 point is what we ended up picking for all our subsample. Um, and then, so let's look at a, a performance benchmark here. So in the performance benchmark problem, we are basically looking at 3,000 distinct geometry. So let me turn off my camera for a little bit. Um, sorry, I have to I have to move to a different place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, Houston is not going through a good time right now. So. Oh. Okay. Done. No worry. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, so in this in this benchmark problem, we're looking at 3,000 distinct geometries. So as you can see in the top here, um, I kind of show an in, in example of what some of these geometry will look like. Um, so you see that um, these are fairly simple geometries, just a toy problem. So um, the beams have different length, different width, and different thickness. The hole um, at the end is of different size. Um, so fairly simple. Um, they're, they're, they're characterized by 
um, I, I believe, three or four different geometric um, parameters. And the geometry are meshed with different number of nodes, um, same element size, um, they're approximately same characteristic length. So the, the difference in, in the number of nodes primarily just come from the difference in the volume. Um, we use a random 80-20 training testing distribution to kind of split the data. Um, these simulations are run with material nonlinearity. Um, they have elastic plastic material with isotropic hardening. Um, we train three different models. So we train a point net, we train a regular um, depot net model, and we train a, a, one of our models, the GM depot net. They have a very similar model size, so it's very moderate, about just 25,000 um, trainable parameters. Um, we train them on a single 800 GPU card. And then we can kind of look at the results. So immediately we see that um, the, the point net running on the same hardware um, took about 74, 74, 50 seconds. So extremely long training time. And it also uses a lot of um, memory. Um, that 800 GPU card has, I think, 40 gigabyte memory and uses almost the full extent of that memory. And then um, because the point net can only predict um, the result only on the point cloud. So we can, we only get result at the subset. So that subset is basically 5,000 nodes um, that we, we randomly sample as the input. So we get about 3.35 3, 3, 3 megapascal of error on the subset. And then the next one is uh, the regular Debo net, uh, which has um, fully connected neural networks in the branch and trunk. You see that lightning fast training time, less than 350 seconds. Um, the similar model size though. Very, very small memory footprint, less than one gigabyte um, on, 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 on the GPU, but it's not doing very good in terms of prediction. So it gets about seven, seven megapascal in the subset, grows a little more um, closer to seven when you predict it um, over the entire mesh. When we look at our model, our model seems to be um, a, a, a kind of a balance of both. So it, it took a little longer to train, um, but less than six, 600 seconds, so less than 10 minutes to get a model. Um, a little bit more than one gigabyte, 1.2 gigabyte of memory, still a lot smaller com considering that we have 40 gigabyte to play with for just one GPU card. But we, we get quite a bit of good accuracy. We, we, we drop the level, we drop the error down to 1.55 on the subset, the growth a little bit, um, 1.57 to all the mesh nodes. So we see that our model can train in less than 10 minutes. And memory footprint is much smaller than the point net um, reference model. Despite a little bit slower than the classical depot net, um, the prediction are much more accurate. So we're kind of doing a trade-off between our training time and uh, kind of the prediction accuracy here. And then and here we, we kind of show some visualization of what these prediction actually look like. Um, so, so here, uh, because of space, I'm only showing the worst case out of all three models. So, so what you're seeing here is already the worst case out of everything in the test set. So, so in the first column here, you see that the, the, the point net prediction. Um, so, so very clearly you see that those are just render as discrete points um, because you, you can only predict them as, as fixed number of points. Um, so 5,000 points that you see in this cloud, I kind of render them as spheres. So it kind of creates a volumetric view to it. Um, so you can you can see that at the, at, the, at the last row where we show the absolute error, we also show the mean absolute error. He, here's about 7.25 megapascal um, on the subset of nodes. In the, in the middle column, you see the, the, the regular deep net prediction. And, and now you see that the big difference is that because we can predict on arbitrary number of nodes, um, we can actually render them as, 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 as a field contour. We, we don't have to render them as discrete points because we can predict one result for every node in the mesh and then we just render them like just anything like classical finite element simulations. So that's why you see the two demo net models, we can render them as field contours. Um, but, and you see in the last column, you see we, we do significantly better um, than the regular demo net model in the worst case, um, dropping to from nearly 22 megapascal prediction error and all the way down to about 7.71 um, for in, 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 in the worst case. So we, we, we tested that um, amount of 600 test designs. So, so we're, we're only showing the worst case to, so that you can kind of see 
what what it does in 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 the worst possible scenario out of 600 randomly selected designs in in the, in the test case and then the main takeaway here is that um, unlike point net we can actually generate um, field contours like what what we're used to um, seeing from finite element simulations so looking deeper into, into this performance benchmark, um, now we kind of turn our attention to interpolation versus extrapolation. Um, when, when you kind of look at a random 80-20 data split, you can kind of think of that as, as more or less interpolation dominant because you're just randomly splitting the data. So, so there's no point believing that there's any bias towards any geometry that kind of goes to the training set, which is the test set. So everything's random. So, so they're more or less uniformly distributed to the point that you can kind of think that it's an interpolation dominated problem. But, but in this case, we we're more interested in what happens when, when we try to extrapolate to geometrically different designs, which is far more critical task in this case. So because, because we're dealing with parametric designs, um, we, we, can, we can define what's, um, what, what's called design distance, which is basically, um, basically simple L2 distance between the design parameters of, of two different designs um, that can tell you how far apart they are, at least in, in, in terms of a parameter space. And we can, we can start from reference design, with which we just arbitrarily pick one um, from, from our data set. Um, and, and from that reference design, we can calculate the design distance of everything else with respect to that reference. And then we can rank the cases um, based on the design distance. And, and this naturally list leads to a design distance-based splitting. So we can have 80% of the most similar designs in the training set, or 20% of the most dissimilar compared to the reference, we leave that in the testing set. So, so this kind of gives you an idea of what happens when you try to really extrapolate beyond things that you see um, that, that are, that are more, more, more and more geometrically different. So, so we can then make a, make a comparison of how the model is doing in an interpolation dominant setting, which is the random case, versus the, 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 the distance based case, which is more an extrapolation dominant case. So on the left here, you see the performance of the regular DeepLearnNet model. Um, when, you, when you look at the performance and all the nodes, it went up from 6.776 um, megapascal stress error all the way up to 11.79. So that's about 74% increase. Um, from the regular deep net model. When we, when we kind of look at um, our model, um, the baseline case um, on, on, on a random, randomly distributed data um, gets you about 1.54. That jumped about 43% um, to about 2.21. So still, yeah, 43% is a lot, but when you, when you kind of compare the absolute increase, um, this is only increased by about um, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 megapascal, where this increased by about like what five megapascal so the absolute increase is huge um, so in this case our model shows a significantly stronger um, capability to generalize to geometrically dissimilar um, data um, geometrically dissimilar geometry that is not seen in a training data set compared to the regular um, yeah, deep operator network we can also um, look at look at more distinctively like a scatter plot to see basically how in the, in individual designs are doing and also how um, as, as a trend line, how the error kind of progresses as we go further and further um, in the parameter space. So, so this is a scatter plot of all the 600 test cases um, and that, that were that were done um, in the in the design distance space data split. So still we get 600. Um, test case and we plot all of them, uh, we, we plot the prediction error with respect to the design distance in the parameter space. And we can see how, how they progress by looking at the trend line, you see a much, much, much larger positive slope for the RIP, for the regular Debo net compared to ours, meaning that um, the regular Debo net, the error grows a lot um, quicker when you, when you try to extrapolate to geometrically non, uh, dissimilar designs. So one last thing in, in, in the performance benchmark that we wanted to look at is basically we wanted to identify what exactly makes um, the, the, the new network architecture more powerful. So to, to recall, our, our, our new additions are basically we're first of all using sign distance function as additional input, um, additional to just using XYZ coordinates. 
we're also using a siren ball um, at, at, at the end of the trunk um, instead of just regular fully connected neural networks. We're also adding um, information fusion in, in the form of an LMOIS multiplication. So we, we perform an ablation study uh, with this distance-based a distance based data split because it's more or less deterministic um, and then you kind of eliminate the randomness of you shuffling the data. Um, we, we kind of look at the performance after uh, of a different variation of the model after we kind of remove different components. So here on, on the first column here, we have the full model, which, which have all these free ingredients. And in, 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 in the first one, we remove the sign distance function. So you see, it jumped up just a little bit. Um, it's still, it, it's a little worse than the full model. And same story for, for Siren, it kind of jumped up just a little bit um, compared to the full model. But when we go to the last one where there's no data fusion, um, you see the error significantly increased by about, goes to like from two point something all the way to like nine megapascal. So from here in, in, in this very quick Appalachian study, we can basically conclude that um, all the features that we have here, um, all these three features, they contribute positively to the model prediction accuracy. But among them, the data fusion is the one that's most, uh, is the most significant contributor um, to, to, to the model accuracy. So at the end, we, we still have all three of them to kind of strengthen our, our capability to generalize to different geometries. So yep, then with, with, with that, um, we, we, we put the benchmark problem out of the way uh, because that's a fairly simple problem. And we kind of move on to something that's a bit more complicated and still just a toy problem, but still um, having a little bit more complexity in terms of geometric variation and also um, the mesh variation. So we're looking at a, a bit more complex geometry. Those are cuboids of different sizes. And then inside they have voids of different shapes. So those voids are basically an ellipsoid. Um, so they're, they're two axes are parameterized. So they can have different various, like vastly different aspect ratios um, in, in, in 3D. And they also, um, we, can, we can also orient them differently by different order angles. So um, we, we have a lot more geo, geometry parameter that controls how these geometry look like. And then in this case, um, we're also in it deliberately meshing the, the geometry with different mesh sizes. Um, to, just, they, they are, they're, they're still all convergent mesh sizes, but we deliberately choose some of the large, uh, smaller element size so that we can scale the mesh count to be more sporadic. Um, because we remember in the previous case, we mesh everything with the same element size and you get more or less kind of the normal distribution. In this case, when we, when we, when we also randomly choose the, the element size, we, we get a lot, a much larger spread of the number of nodes um, in the data set. So that's also added complexity. And I, I, again, we're dealing with um, elastic plastic um, isotropic hardening for material nonlinearity. We still, um, as our baseline models, they're just about 25,000 um, trainable parameters. We still train them on a single 800 GPU card. Here, we're, we're predicting um, now, before, in, in the first use case, we we're just predicting the stress, so it's really just a scalar prediction. Um, in, in this case, we're, we're predicting a vector field. So we're predicting both the Mises stress as well as the, as the displacement vector in 3D. So we're predicting four different variables on each node. And then we're rendering them simultaneously. Like we're deforming the mesh according to the predicted displacement. And we're further counter plot um, on the Mises stress. So here we, we kind of show the baseline result. Um, the baseline model here, um, actually, uh, yeah, this is the, the, the more accurate number. It has 48,298 trainable parameters. When we, when we compare that to the number of degrees of freedom in the meshes, you see that about 95% of meshes actually have more degrees of freedom than number of trainable parameters in this model. So this kind of gives you an idea of how small this model is um, that we're using. And then, and then here we can kind of look, look at some baseline result. Um, training of this model took longer um, because some of these uh, meshes are quite a bit larger. Um, it's about 46, 36 seconds. And then the stress error uh, is about seven megapascal. Relatively, that's about converts to about five percent, and um, some mean absolute error for the displacement and relative about nine percent. And then here we kind of show a distribution over the test set. 
you know, what those contour plot look like for different percentiles. So from the left to right for each column, we progressively go to the best case, the 70 percentile, 80th percentile, 90th percentile, and then the worst case. So we, we progressively go go to worst case, go go to, um, larger and larger in prediction error. And notice that we kind of showed the, 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 the worst end of the spectrum to kind of give you an idea of how this is doing kind of in, 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 in the worst case scenario. And then you can see that um, these displacements are, are scaled up by, I think some 250 times um, to, to kind of show 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 you the differences. So in the first row, um, everything is a finite element result. So the displacement is a finite element computer displacement. Um, the contour is the uh, visa stress from the simulation. Second row here, everything is predicted by the neural network. So we, we deform the mesh by the predicted displacement. We, we color it based on the predicted mesa stress. And then in and the last, last row, we just plot the difference. So right off the bat, you see the worst case, um, it's just not doing it. And it doesn't know what it's doing, um, which is kind of reasonable um, for, for, for worst case scenario. But you can see up all the way up to about 90 percentile, it actually kind of knows what, what, what it is doing. Um, it knows that as the, as the orientation and the size of the void is evolving, it knows how that um, how it affects the deformed shape of, 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 of the cuboid and how that affects the stress contour um, in terms of where the high stress concentration area are and where the low stress basically um, the, the, the the low stress region are like immediately above and below the 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 void and normal to the loading direction. And then we wanted to look at um, what happens if we just increase the model size without any other kind of model problem specific hyperparameter optimization. So in this case, we, we went up from about 38,000 all the way up to 150,000. So that's about um, three, four X of increase. And um, you see that the training time went up mildly by about 21%. Um, and then we reduced um, we, we get a lot better in terms of our prediction error, um, lower lower mean absolute error, lower uh, mean and um, lower lower relative error, then and also same story for the displacement. We can also look at how the prediction error kind of progresses as we venture further and further in the design space. So that the the larger the, the distance, the more you're extrapolating from what you see um, in the training set. So everything has a positive slope, um, and then and then for for the most part, and you see for most solution component, for the Mises stress displacement in the x and z direction, increasing the model size actually decreased the the, the positive coefficient in front of the um, basically the slope. So meaning that um, for most cases, um, except for this one, except for um, UY, um, your prediction error is increasing at a less steep rate when you um, simply increase the model size. So this basically tells us that um, if, if you have something that's a bit more complicated, um, having such a small model might not give you the desired level of accuracy. In this case, I, mean, I, have mean, a, I mean, I have a question. So yeah, yeah. looking at all these plots and the previous, it seems that the outliers, let's say if you look at the, the leftmost plot, the MA in the stress, you mm -hmm. get... Uh, Big errors like uh, hundred. There's a point at uh, one hundred, but both for the baseline and the larger error. So, are these not important? Because it's yeah, not just yeah. one point. There's, there's quite a few points in that. Yeah, that, 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 yeah that's a that's a that's a great question, I and mean, that those are basically towards the 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 this side this end of the spectrum, which is which is also why we're we're, we're not showing anything like from best case all the way up to like 50 percentile because those, those they kind of look okay that's why we we kind of primarily shift the, the the presentation over to looking at the worst the worst end of the spectrum to, right, to but, make sure that... so i was wondering how do you select the training or also the down sampling uh is it an unbiased totally random or you can actually bias yeah, yes. Yeah, that that's a very good point. So yeah, yeah, that that's actually one of the the, the idea that we had is instead of randomly sampling um, that we we don't know anything, we actually bias the sampling towards some of the region where it's most likely uh, where the stress gradient is the highest. 
so because because that's typically where um, you see larger error um, which which you can see um, from some of these distribution of the error that's typically where the the, the error is the highest so we, we deliberately bias the, the the sample the subsampling towards those regions so that it kind of understands a bit more that's definitely a, a very good suggestion that we, we we have not yet implemented in this work yet yeah that's a, that's a great question thank you thank you Yep. Any any other questions at this point? Okay. Yeah. If not, then I'll continue to go forward. Um. Yeah. So so we we use this very simple example to kind of demonstrate it um, without doing any um, problem specific hyperparameter optimization. You 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 can decrease your prediction error and enhance the generalizability um, by just increasing the model size. And then um, we can kind of look at how our prediction time is doing compared to the simulation time. Um, we can we can run them. We, we can we can plot them for for everything um, in 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 the test case. So you can see um, for to find an element simulation naturally, um, they kind of grow up um, as as you have more and more um, number of degrees of freedom, which is kind of an obvious trend, which we also observe. In, in in our um, neural network prediction um so as, as as you try to run prediction on more and more degrees of freedom your prediction do take a little bit longer and then um, as, as you have a larger model um, your prediction also take longer um, on the same number of degrees of freedom compared to using a smaller model so everything kind of makes sense here and then when you when you when you compute the the the, the number of times that we uh, speed up compared to running a simulation on on, on finite element and getting the result on the prediction, um, you see that we can we can get upwards of about ten to the fifth times speed up if your model is large enough. Um, for for some of the smaller model like very small mesh um, finite element simulation actually gets done pretty quickly. But um, the time really scales up um, when you when when the model size kind of increases for the finite element model, which we 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 have. Um, I'm I'm gonna cover in the next slide uh, some more study on the scalability of both methods. So finally, we wanted to kind of look at um, performance scaling of the train model and and kind of compare that with with just finite element simulations. So we, we wanted to try to make prediction on a successively refined meshes of basically the same geometry. And this is also a, a check for how we're doing in terms of mesh sensitivity, because at the end of the day, it's defined by um, a, a point cloud. And, and those point clouds, as, as um, they're randomly sampled. So every time you, you sample it, you, you get different point clouds. So you see a slightly different representation of, still essentially just the same thing. So we wanted to see um, what happens when we slightly change the mesh. Um, um, so that's mesh M1 and M1-1. So we basically changed the phase meshing um, method. So the mesh is a little different, um, still same element size. Um, and then for mesh two and three, we reduce the element size so that uh, we get more and more elements, um, progressively refined meshes um, from M1, M2, and M3. So we list all of those there, and then um, you can see the number of nodes went uh, all the way to about 48,000 um, on the smallest mesh, all the way up to about 1.7 million nodes in, in, in the finest mesh. And then um, you can also see that reflected in the finite element time. Um, the, the largest one definitely takes the longest. Um, and, then, and then we can compare that to our prediction time um, about two, on the order of two millisecond um, to get the prediction on mesh M1 and the, the other mesh that with same mesh density. Um, and then the, the, the largest mesh, we get uh, the prediction in about 36 millisecond. So it's quite a bit faster than um, what we can do um, with running the simulation directly. And then on, on, on this same mesh- I have a question here, sorry. Yeah. So yeah. this, yeah, uh, this uh, mesh sensitivity analysis here, so the accuracy of this depends on the variation of the solution inside the domain, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's a have, great question. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, this, yes. Yeah. Please, please so go ahead. You, Sorry. So did did you analyze that for different variations of the the uh, the solution in the domain, or 
like when you have like different gradients and different uh, location in the 3D domain? Or uh, sorry, what, 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 so, what do so, you mean? So, so this mesh sensitivity, right? If you have uh, mm -hmm. high gradients in some regions and if you don't have mm -hmm. enough points, uh, you cannot basically capture those variations, right? In the solution. So, you mean so, variation in the solution field itself? Yes. So, so you train on a coarse mesh, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then you, and then you wanna, uh, uh, you wanna check the accuracy of uh, your prediction on a high resolution mesh, right? That's what you're mm -hmm. doing here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying if, if, if the, uh, if the exact flow field has a lot of variation and gradients, right? This sensitivity analysis, uh, like it could be, you know, could not be accurate, basically. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we make sure that even at the courses mesh level, the final element result don't change that much, which, which we'll, 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 we'll show in the next slide. Uh, we actually have a comparison of how the finite element result are changing just by refining the mesh. So, so this one we we make sure oh, that okay. um, even in the in 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 the, in the courses case the result are more or less convergent. Uh, so so okay, so continue okay. to refine the meshes just for the sake of testing how our our, our prediction changes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that that that's okay. a great question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we can see that for the same geometry, same mesh, um, the final element result, which I'll show in the next slide, um, they're kind of converging. And then um, the result, they're more or less um, within some oscillation, um, pretty much consistent throughout different meshes. Um, those are aggregate measures, of course, um, average over the whole mesh. Um, and then again, aggregate measure for the displacement vector um, for uh, over all three components. Um, we can also see that um, they're more or less co consistent, um, about 1.4, 1.5 um, times 10 to the four, uh, negative four millimeters. Um, when we when we kind of zoom in a little bit and kind of move away from aggregate measures, uh, at, at the end, aggregate measures just tell you the, the, the aggregate over all the nodes. And, and when you look at the actual nodes themselves, they, they might not be. Um, so, so we kind of look at um, some of the more local measures. So we, we, we would perform three probes. So those are, those are basically paths um, along different slice. Um, and the, the, so we slice it at the middle and then we pass three different probes um, uh, along, along the, the section plane. And then we plot the result um, of the one Mises stress. So um, going back to the previous question, um, you can see when we look at all the solid lines, the solid lines are all the finite element results. And then, and then the last one is with error bar plus minus 5%, you see that um, the solid lines are all on top of each other. So even in the, in, 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 in the, in the coarsest mesh case, the, the stress is pretty converged um, and, and we're sampling along these line um, a thousand points. Um, so to make sure that there's no aliasing error um, due to us kind of sampling on the mesh. Um, so we, we, we sample these paths sufficiently fine. Um, so the, the key takeaway here is that when you kind of move away from aggregate measures and actually look at local measures and how exactly the field is along this line, it it, it you do see some variation. So when you when you look at the dash line, uh, the dash lines are basically the neural network prediction uh, across different meshes. Um, so you do see that there are some variation. They don't they don't exactly lie over on top of each other, especially um, kind of some of the lower stress lower stress region. So you do see that in here the dash line a little bit far further apart here, which is something that you consistently see um, on these higher stress region. Um, the the dash lines are more more or less on top of each other. Um, kind of less so when when your stress is low, um, you, you do see different different kind of dash lines showing here. Um, so finally, we kind of look at the time scaling of of, 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 of the train model so that um, we have four different data points um, from the previous exercise from our four meshes. We can we can kind of plot them. On a, on a log log plot and number of degrees of freedom versus the computational time, 
And then we can kind of look at look at their asymptotic scaling. Um, so the the final element simulation scales about uh, 1.36. So that's typical for sparse for sparse direct solvers. Um, and then and then for the, the prediction, we achieved um, about the scaling is on, on the order of n to the 0 0.83, where n is the number of degrees of freedom in the in in in, in the problem. So we 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 can we can achieve sublinear scaling um, in, in in terms of the prediction. And then finally when we also look at the memory consumption, the memory usage of, of, of making such a prediction um, we see that um, it scales at about n, n to the 0 0.62 um, in terms of the peak memory usage um, during prediction. Um, and then we can see that if you have 40 gigabyte of memory and you follow that asymptotic scaling, um, you, you, you can theoretically accommodate something with 70 million degrees of freedom. Um, but we, 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 we we did not actually test that, so so this is more just extrapolation um, based on the observed data that the four points of data that we have. But yeah, so um, kind of into, into into conclusions, um, we we perf we basically provide a novel deep operator network model to make few predictions on parametric three D geometries. We include sine distance function, um, sire networks, and intermediate data fusion to enhance our spatial encoding capabilities of the model. And our model is more accurate than PointNet and regular DeepNet model in a benchmark problem, and also have a relatively small memory footprint um, when, when training. So model prediction can be several orders of magnitude faster than finite element simulation once the model is trained. And we see that um, the superior efficiency and prediction accuracy of the proposed model would make it a, a very useful tool to assist in rapid um, preliminary design evaluation at the early design stage. And finally, um, in terms of code availability, we do make all the examples available, um, both in terms of the source code and the actual data set. Um, so you can you can you can get this source code in a data set and we, we host everything on the on, on a GitHub repo, which if interested, you can you can always get the data in, in the QR code below. And then um, our paper was also recently published in CMAME um, under open access. Um, if you're interested, you can all, also also get the paper um, from the QR code below. And with that, I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Yeah, Varun has, yeah. Uh, hi, Jimmy. This is Varun from Brown. I'm a PhD student here. Hey, hi, Varun. Nice to uh, meet very you. Very nice talk. Thank you for um, this presentation. Um, I had a question about, like, could you please, please explain the distance metric that you used for uh, identifying which geometries are widely different from training cases. I think it was slide 11. Oh, maybe. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so exactly that one. What exactly was that, that metric measuring? Oh, so, so because because uh, because these are parameterized geometry, so, so every yeah. every geometry comes in in, 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 in in a set of parameter, the geometry uh, parameter that we use to des describe it. So those are basically just L two L two norm in the in, in the parametric space, and and then we kind of normalize them so that so that the the scale of each parameter don't don't kind of scale one over the other. So mm -hmm. so that's why you see the little head here. That those are those, we we first normalize them so everything goes from zero to one, and then we kind of take the pick the L two norm of the distance. So we 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 just randomly pick a reference design. Um. So so so. We can we can compute the design distance relative to that random reference, and and then we can kind of rank them so that so that all the similar ones are in the training, and then all the kind of far away one compared to that reference design are in the, in the testing. So one uh, in in one of our paper, Lulu introduced in the uh, extrapolation deep deep on it paper. I think Lulu is online, so he can comment. Uh, he introduced uh, the Wasserstein distance something similar, and he found that how the errors grow with the Wasserstein distance. But mm -hmm. it's the same idea for that you to, to quantify how far outside of the distribution you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 But, and he, in fact, found a, a uh, scale, the scaling 
uh, for those benchmarks that we had in the paper. It's called the extrapolation depot net or something like that. That's the paper. Lulu, am mm -hmm. I right? Uh, yes. So in your case, we assume this space is Fourier space. So we cannot use the standard, let's say, the simple L2. We need a more complicated uh, the metric. But here, yes, for this, you, for your case, I believe, yes, the simple L2 could work. I will send the link to all people in the chat. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be great. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. And I had like a, one more or two more questions. So the other question I had was, uh, I guess, like if I understand it correctly, the SDF was not used with the vanilla deponent, right? Uh, sorry. The... So you did not use the SDF as an input to the vanilla deponent, if I understand correctly. No, it's just the okay. X Y Z coordinate. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you were computing the SDF. Uh, did you yeah. have any issues with like not being able to capture all the points on the surface accurately, um, things like that? Oh, so 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 yeah, we 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 do everything in the discretized sense. So the the SDF is computed with respect to the discretized surface. Okay. So yeah, so, so, that's so, so, so not with respect that, to the analytical like CAT surface. It's, it's a discretized mesh surface. It's a mesh, right? Yeah, so this is a everything is mesh based. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. do you have a sense of like how different the output field was between training and testing uh, data? Like, assuming what, like what? you have a parameter space, um, you have like a load condition, and mm -hmm. you have twenty five hundred samples. Mm -hmm. Um, so you get a like displacement field. So do you have a sense of how different the fields are between training and testing cases? Like uh, no, we, we we didn't specifically look, um, but but they are quite a bit different because even even in this case, when we actually split the designs based on you know the 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 design uh kind of variation. Um so so note that when we only rank them by um by geometric kind of parameter. So so in the in the full data set, they they're they're not only Varying by um, design parameter, we're also varying how they are, how they get loaded. So so there's mm -hmm. also load parameter and, and and load are excluded from the calculation of, 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 of this distance. So so between the training and, and testing, that the load is still randomly distributed. So 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 that also contributes to to variation in 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 the output field in the in the training and testing. If that if that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, understood. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Cool. Yeah, yeah, thank right. you. Great Do, question. Yeah. Do we Suku have from... any other questions from Jadis? Oh, Suku. Yeah, 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 Suku from Davis. Uh, I had a question on, on, on the predictions, right? I mean, if you look at the predictions and say, okay, I want to just compare between regions which are elastic and regions which are plastic, mm -hmm. right? And you look at and just look at like, like a qualitative sort of comparison of your predictions versus uh, the the exact numerical or FEM solution. Mm -hmm. How do they how do they compare, right? I mean, just looking oh, at that, a, that's a, binary, that's a good point. binary that's a good kind of point. choice, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. just one, yeah. right? You take black as one color and you know white as one color and look at okay, I want to look at the field as a contour, right? And look at and compare, okay, what are the regions which are elastic still and what are the regions that have gone plastic? And then mm -hmm. you compare with, with the with the uh, with the you know your network predictions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great point. So you wanted to see how the 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 the, the elastic plastic boundary is right. between the, the 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 prediction and the final element. On yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a because, that's a great. Because, point. You know, whenever yeah. you do you know approximate interpolation or. You know, curve fitting. Then you know, especially for such nonlinear, highly nonlinear problems. You know, which could be also rate dependent. You know, if you have more complexity, then it's not mm -hmm. clear. You know, if the regions, uh, if that boundary is, is kind of gets messed up because you don't know how the material is behaving, right? I mean, you're just mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. using just data to drive your solution. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. unless you have some physics which is also incorporated, right, which will enhance your simulations. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't yeah, think that, it's just your really good physics, right? So because otherwise it has no way to know what's going on, right? So mm -hmm, that was the mm -hmm. thought. But at least it'll give yeah. you, a, even what you have done, it'll give you at least a qualitative assessment of your results mm -hmm. to compare 
plastic part and the plastic parts, okay, at least they are in the ballpark, right? What the mm-hmm. values are, could be, you know, slightly off based on what then your values make more sense, right? Because you're comparing apples to apples and then comparing the solutions at a certain point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was the problem. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah. I have a question, uh, Jimmy. On um, it's always very difficult in in, in geometry and coding to capture the uh, multi scale features. So the hole that you had was relatively big, but if you try to have uh, <laughs> yes, a big hole, a big yeah. hole and a small hole, and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a great point, and 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 especially when you when you just try to randomly subsample. I mean, you you may or may not miss some small scale feature that are, that are of different different length scale compared to the overall geometry. So 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 definitely, it it's it's gonna have a very really hard time trying to trying to distinguish those small scale features because the the subsampling process is at, at this point it is kind of random so you you you're only going to get coverage like the coverage is going to be approximately proportional to volume so so if 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 some feature that you have are, are very small in, in in terms of comparatively volume wise then the the chance of you randomly sampling something near that wall near that region is very low so 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 that's definitely a, a limitation towards towards this um the the the, the issue of subsampling is you, you always have 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 this uncertainty um of where you're sampling within the volume which is which is something that we we wanted to avoid in in, in, in instead of subsampling have have a more kind of I, I guess none I, I guess more deterministic way of, of describing the geometry instead of relying on random sample of, of the point. So yeah, definitely that's a that's a, that's a great question and it definitely points to a limitation of, of the way that we're currently using a point clouds bait, just randomly sample point cloud. Yeah. That's it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, so also just to follow up on that, uh um have you when you were doing your thesis, did you consider using graph neural networks, for example, because we work with some people and they have pretty good success using graph neural networks or another, somebody else is using transformers, for example, and there's papers on transformers for coding the geometry. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's also something that we we kind of consider that we didn't, we didn't push, we didn't push very far on on this. I think the, the main reason is, um, like like if if you have more experience on 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 this then definitely uh that we, we we can we can we can see potential collaboration in the future is basically how to build the graph for something for 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 geometry that are kind of changing in terms of the number of nodes and elements because your 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 graphs the the size of the graph are going to be different too right yeah yeah yeah, you I can use the graph embeddings like you did, for example, with the with the uh, to have a fixed size, like mm-hmm. uh, from from different graphs. But so that that can be solved. But the, the multi scale feature is. Uh, uh, by the way, we are uh, uh, our group here is supported by ANSYS. Uh, for uh, are you under a Jay Pathak? Group or yeah, yeah, I, I, I know, I know Jay's in the CTO's office. I, I think Professor Kaniyadaki, I think uh, some months ago, you you actually made a presentation at the at, at, at Ansys, right? It was one of the tech talk, one of the the tech talk hosted by the Yeah, I I, yeah. I, I I I was there listening to your talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, no, but I'm saying I'm saying because we're already collaborating and they're they're supporting us. So there is a um, mm-hmm. we after that we expanded to. Um, Another division in, uh, I think, uh, antenna design of mm-hmm. antennas, mm-hmm. and uh, so so. But are you under J or is it a different division? You're different. No, no, it's a it's a it's a different it's a different division. So so I I mostly work in the application division, where where, okay. where Jay's teams more in the in the research and development yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, thanks for coming, uh, Jim. Today it was a great talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank thank you so much for ho- hosting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jim. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We, Thank you, everyone. Do we have any other questions from the audience? 
for final questions? Oh, it looks like we do not. Uh, thank you so much, Jimmy, for your presentation today. It was a, this was a wonderful talk. And uh, with this, we can close this week's crunch seminar. So see you all next week. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a have a good weekend. Bye. You too. Bye.